Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'm glad that you're here. Special welcome to those of you that are online. Um, I think this is the part where we turn to someone that we didn't walk in with this morning and say good morning. <laughs> Okay. Just just a few announcements this morning. Um, we received word uh, yesterday that uh, Richard uh, Junis, uh, the father of Deb Plock, who was a long-term member, passed away this weekend. Uh, we also received word from Elaine Weber that her husband Chuck has been hospitalized. So we'll keep them in our prayers. Uh, also, another couple of reminders, uh, the spring book read uh, is on May 13th at 9.30 at Mimosa. We'd be glad to have you join us. Uh, uh, you can look further for further information in the bulletin. And then we are looking for grass cutters for this season. So if you are able to help out, please contact Stan Druckery. And then... Um, Let's see. Oh, and I have one other uh, prayer request. Uh, this is a, my son-in-law's mother is in her final days up in Wisconsin Rapids, so I'd like to keep his family uh, in our prayers as well. And then we have one uh, a financial update from Dave. Good morning. So any month that we have a positive net income is a good month, right? March was a good month. <clears throat> net income for the month of March was a positive $3,229. That means our year to date is now a positive $768. That is good for this time of year. Some extra gifting was a big help this past month, and we're kind of wondering if maybe having envelopes available did help. We think it did. Budget numbers look good for this time of year. Income is up $6,000, but expenses are also up the same amount, mainly due to the winter utilities. Compared to last year, income is up 10,000, and expenses are down 4,000. So we're $14,000 ahead of last year. Thank you, Trinity, for your ongoing financial support. We hope to be able to have another favorable month in April. Project Uplift. The balance in the account is $39,915, and we had income of $313. Stories to share. Um, we'd like to highlight again this month the cost-saving measure that we're able to have because of the lay worship team to lead worship on Sundays and weekends that pastor is not here. That saves us the cost of the substitute pastor. And as you know, this weekend, that lay worship team um, did lead service, so we thank them for their leadership talents. Also, the Easter season, we can also celebrate the gathering of Trinity's family and friends in person during Holy Week. Church attendance was up, and it was good to see many familiar faces again in church. Thank you. <clears throat> Please stand as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, by whose hand we are given new birth, and by whose speaking we are given new life. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are welcomed, restored, and supported as citizens of the new creation. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. Holy God, holy and merciful, holy and mighty, you are the river of life. You are the everlasting wellspring. In mercy and might, you have freed us from death and raised us with Jesus, the firstborn of the dead. In baptismal waters, our old life is washed away, 
and in them we are born anew. Glory to you for oceans and lakes, for rivers and streams. Honor to you for waters that wash us clean, quench our thirst, and nurture both crops and creatures. Praise to you for the life-giving water of baptism, the outpouring of the spirit of the new creation. Satisfy the world's need through this living water, where drought dries the earth, bring refreshment, where despair prevails, grant hope, where chaos reigns, bring peace. We ask this through Christ, who with you and the Spirit reigns forever. Amen. Please, uh, our opening hymn is All Are Welcome in the Red Book, verses 1, 2, and 5. The Lord be with you. God of all nations, you made it clear that all people are invited to partake of the glory of your salvation. Help us to invite all people to your goodness so that no one might be forgotten in your saving grace. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated, and I invite Stan to do the reading.
Good morning. Peter crosses the immense religious and social boundary that separates Jews from Gentiles in order to proclaim the good news of Jesus' life, death, <clears throat> and resurrection so that God's forgiveness in Jesus' name would reach out to all people. While Peter shares the good news of Jesus with a Gentile soldier and his family, the Holy Spirit comes upon them, recognizing that the Spirit's works inclusively in the lives of both Jews and Gentiles. Peter commands that these Gentiles also be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Reading from the 10th chapter of Acts. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon at about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? He answered, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him. And after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. About noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven open and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again, a second time, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up to heaven. Now, while Peter was greatly puzzled about what to make of this vision that he had seen, suddenly the men sent by Cornelius appeared. They were asking for Simon's house and were standing by the gate. They called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, look, three men are searching for you. Now get up, go down, and go with them without hesitation, for I have sent them. So Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? They answered, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So Peter invited them in and gave them lodging. The next day he got up and went with them, and some of the believers from Joppa accompanied him. The following day they came to Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relative and close friends. On Peter's arrival, Cornelius met him and falling at his feet, worshiped him. But Peter made him get up saying, stand up, I am only a mortal. And as he was talked with him, he went in and found that many had assembled. And he said to them, you yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with a visit, a Gentile, to visit a Gentile. But God has shown me 
that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. Now may I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius replied, four days ago at this very hour at three o'clock, I was praying in my house when suddenly a man in dazzling clothes stood before me. He said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard and your alms have been remembered before God. Send therefore to Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. Therefore I sent for you immediately and you have been kind enough to come. So now all of us are here in the presence of God to listen to all the Lord has commanded you to say. Then Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. <coughs> Excuse me. But God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testified about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even to the Gentiles for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, can they, anyone without the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. The word of the Lord. Jesus begins to train his disciples, including people in the ministry that he has shown them up to this point. The Lord sends the laborers to gather the harvest. The gospel reading is from the ninth chapter of Matthew. Then Jesus went ahead all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest the Gospel of the Lord.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, so today we are going to explore the story that we just heard in a little bit of a different way. So if you notice the boards behind me here, you will benefit from being able to see them. So if you need to, now is the time to move forward. We have several pews here, or if you're a kid or anybody else who can easily get up and down off the floor, you can come and sit right up front too. Um, so we've already heard the story today, but every time we hear a story, even once we've heard it a hundred times before, there can be something new in it for us. So while I tell the story with the visuals, I encourage you to keep your hearts and your minds open to what the Spirit may be showing you today. Um, at the end of the story, we will all wonder together. This is a time to talk about what we notice and what we feel. There are no right or wrong answers. So don't be afraid to talk. Um, Let's get ready and center our hearts and minds by taking a deep breath in and out. There once was a man who said such wonderful things and did such amazing things that people followed him, wanting to learn more about who he really was and hoping to see the miracles that he would perform. But he spoke out against the systems that were separating people. The people in power were focused on purity and division. They believed in a world with sharp social boundaries between pure and impure, righteous and sinner, clean and unclean, male and female, rich and poor, Jew and Gentile. The people with power were afraid of the changes that Jesus spoke about. So they killed him in a horribly painful and humiliating way. But that was not the end of his story. In the months after Jesus was killed and rose and ascended into heaven, his followers continued saying wonderful things and doing amazing things for others. It was dangerous work at times, but they were committed to spreading the good news. And that is our story today. Simon Peter was one of Jesus's closest friends and a leader. He traveled around and visited communities of believers. He healed people who were paralyzed, and he even brought a woman named Dorcas back to life. The miracles that God worked through Peter led many people to believe in Jesus. And after he raised Dorcas in Joppa, he stayed in the town for a while at the home of a man named Simon. Now, while Peter was in Joppa, another story was developing about a day's journey north at the sea coast in a city called Caesarea. The whole area was under control of the Roman Empire. So many Roman soldiers and officials lived there. Cornelius was a Roman centurion. He was an outsider to following Jesus. He was not Jewish like Peter, and Jesus' other followers were. But he was a devout man whose family loved God. Cornelius consistently and generously gave to the poor, and he constantly prayed to God. And one afternoon, he 
had a vision of a messenger of God. He was terrified of this visitor. The angels in the Bible are often very scary figures. But the messenger said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayers. He has seen your kindness to the poor. God has taken notice of you. The messenger gave Cornelius directions. It said, send men south to Joppa, to the house of a tanner named Simon. Ask to speak to a guest of his, who is also named Simon, but called Peter. You will find this house near the waterfront. And with that, the messenger departed. Cornelius immediately followed God's direction. Cornelius called two of his servants and one of his most devout soldiers. He told them everything that the messenger had said so they would know exactly where to go. And they set off toward Joppa right away. Now the next day, around noon, completely unaware of the events in Caesarea and the visitors on the way, after all they didn't have phones or the internet back then, Peter had no idea what was about to happen. He went up to the roof of Simon's house to pray and to wait for lunch. The flat roof of the house was a perfect place to get fresh air and to feel closer to God. And while Peter was up there, hungry before lunchtime, he had a vision of his own, linking that lunchtime hunger to the people he was about to meet. In Peter's vision, a rift opened up in the sky. And a sheet full of creatures descended down through the torn opening. This large sheet was full of all kinds of animals, those with four feet, those that crawl, those that fly, pigs, bats, lizards, snakes, frogs and toads, and vultures. Creatures that normally would not be associated with lunch in his culture. And Peter heard a voice say, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter responded, no way, Lord. These animals, these are forbidden in the dietary laws of the Hebrew scriptures. I have never eaten unclean, non-kosher foods like these before. Never in my life. I can't start now. But the voice corrected him, saying, if God calls something 
permissible, and clean, you must not call it forbidden and dirty. Peter saw the vision three times. After the third time, the container of animals flew back up through the rift in the sky. The rift healed and the voice was gone. Peter was confused and unsettled as he tried to make sense of the strange vision. But he didn't have long to wait. At that very moment, Peter heard the voices of Cornelius's delegation. He could hear them in the distance asking for him, but Peter's mind was still racing about the vision. He was distracted when the voice of the Holy Spirit once again broke through his churning thoughts. The voice said, the three men who are searching for you have been sent by me. So get up, go with them. Do not hesitate or argue. So Peter rushed downstairs to meet the men. He said, I am the one you are seeking. Can you tell me why you've come? So the visitors explained to Peter who had sent them and why. And they asked him to return to Caesarea with them and to share the good news with all of Cornelius's household. Since it was already late in the day, they stayed overnight in Joppa, and then the next morning, all of them joined by a few more of the believers who lived in Joppa, prepared for their travels, and they began the journey back to Caesarea. Cornelius had gathered his friends and his relatives. And he was eagerly anticipating their arrival. So they journey. And they finally made it to Cornelius' house. Once they were welcomed inside, Peter said to Cornelius, you know that our culture considers it a breach of divine law to associate with outsiders like you. But recently, God has shown me that I should not consider anyone beneath me or unclean. That's why I came so willingly today. Now, let me hear the story of why you invited me here. So Cornelius told Peter his story of meeting God's messenger just a few days earlier. And he said, so here we are, together in the presence of God, 
ready to take in all that the Lord has told you to tell us. He was ready. And Peter was ready, too. He was finally ready to share the story of Jesus so that all could experience God's love. Peter finally understood his vision. He said, it's clear to me now that God plays no favorites. God accepts every person, no matter their culture or their ethnic background. God welcomes all. Peter went on telling Cornelius and all who were gathered there about Jesus' message of peace and all of the amazing and wonderful things Jesus had said and done. After telling of Jesus' crucifixion, Peter said, we even got the privilege of seeing him again after his resurrection. We witnessed this miracle, we ate, and we even drank with him. And he told us to spread the message that he is the one. And now, with the Holy Spirit and your household, the message is spreading beyond our Jewish roots and beyond the barriers that people have created, beyond the rifts that divide us. Now, Peter wasn't done sharing the good news. But suddenly, as it often does, the Holy Spirit interrupted. The Spirit came upon everyone listening. Now, just as had happened to the Jewish disciples at the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit came to those listening, they began speaking in foreign languages. Their hearts overflowed, praising God. The Jewish followers who were with Peter were stunned to see that the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on outsiders. They had never witnessed or even heard of something like that before. Peter took in all that he saw and responded by asking, can anyone here give any good reason not to ceremonially wash these people through baptism as fellow disciples? After all, it's obvious that they have received the Holy Spirit just as we did on the day of Pentecost. Now, of course, no one could object, seeing that it no longer mattered if followers of Jesus had always been followers of Jewish ritual. So Peter had them baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and spent many more days there in Caesarea teaching and sharing fellowship. So now is the time for wondering. I wonder which part of the story you like the best. The 
just shout it out or raise your hand if that's more comfortable. like about this story? to get to that aha moment. Yeah. Anyone else have a favorite part of the story? I wonder which part of the story might be the most important part for you today. Maybe there's something that really stood out to you between the reading and the visuals, or maybe there's something that is relating to your life right now. Cornelius never got the messenger. No one would have come. Peter's vision, he may never have figured out. Or if Peter met the visitors but didn't have the vision, maybe he would never have gone to Caesarea. Every part can be. Yeah. I wonder how Peter felt during that vision when he's seeing these things that he doesn't quite understand. Or how would you have felt if you were Peter in that moment? Scared. Scared? What else? Then I think he was scared and he uh, was hopeful that there's peace in the Lord. Ah, hopeful of his peace in the Lord. Yeah. Peter had spent a lot of time traveling with Jesus, so hopefully he picked up a few things by that point. To give him some comfort and some hope. What else might he have been feeling? Maybe frustration. Ah, frustration. What would he have been frustrated about? That he couldn't figure it out right away. That yeah. That, uh, you know, he tended to jump to conclusions sometimes, so, you know, but he kind of waited this time. Yeah. He did. He did learn something, and he might have been frustrated by not understanding and not being able to jump to those conclusions right away. Raise your hand if you have ever felt like any of those feelings of Peter, where you had something you didn't understand, and you were frustrated, or you were scared, or maybe hopeful in the Lord. Yeah, those are a lot of big feelings. Now, what about Cornelius? I wonder how he was feeling during all of this. He's an outsider. He is Roman. He does not follow any of the Jewish custom. He's not part of their culture. He is considered someone who a messenger of God probably wouldn't have gone to. 
at least why Peter and, and the other disciples would never have expected that. So how might he be feeling throughout this story? Sad. Sad. Yeah. Lonely. Lonely. Afraid. Afraid. Yeah. What else? What kind of feelings might get him to listen to that messenger of God? Praying. Hmm? Praying. Yeah, he prayed a lot. Looking for God's guidance and help. confused and worrying about fitting in. Do you think he had any positive feelings around it too? I think he was happy when he saw that he came back with his messengers. Yeah. He came back with his messengers. Yeah, happy that Peter actually showed up. Yeah. I wonder if any of you have ever felt like Cornelius. Have you ever felt like an outsider, maybe felt unwelcome or not sure if you fit in somewhere? Raise your hands if you don't want to talk. Yeah, that's a big feeling that a lot of us have too. So I wonder in those moments, who helps you when you're feeling unsure who is like your Peter who comes and leads the way for you or who has helped to support you in your faith your parents are a huge influence and they show you who else to turn to. I have a girlfriend that's been very supportive and there that I can talk about anything. Excellent. Those kinds of friends are really important. Who else? Who has been a guide and, and encouraged you in your faith journey? Your cousin. All right. My grandma. Grandma. Grandmas do a lot of good. Yeah. My aunt. Hmm? My aunt. Your aunts. Lots of family making a difference. Does anyone have someone in the church who has helped you on your faith journey? either this church or outside of it. I saw some hands go up. Yeah. I wonder if any of you have ever been like Peter. Have any of you helped other people on their faith journeys? Or have you shared the story of Jesus Christ so all may experience God's love, as we say? Yeah. I see some hands go up. Does anybody want to share an example of how you've done that? All the time. Yeah. That's a time to have God close to you, huh? Yeah. Yeah. My brother who lives in a nursing home, he has a park in front of me. Um, we talk every day, and he feels bad. His pastor, he, he lives away from where his church is. His pastor doesn't started when we pray together and he'll ask us questions and stuff like that or we'll read part of the Bible or some scripture, Easter story together, um, just things like that. Yeah, just being with people. 
and sharing God with them. That's great. Now I wonder if the story reminds you of anything else, maybe another Bible story or something that you've heard on the news, something you learned in school, or something you've even experienced in your own life. Do you have any connections that you would like to share? In adult Bible study this week, we talked about how having the vision three times and having the three visitors wasn't Peter's only experience in a set of threes. He three times denied knowing Jesus. He three times said, yes, Lord, I love you. And Jesus told him to feed his sheep, to care for his lambs. They waited three days for Jesus to rise. Lots and lots of threes. So that was a connection that we found. Anyone else have another connection you would like to share? Right. So as you go out into the world this week, I would encourage you to try to be like Peter and Cornelius. Look for the outsiders, share the story, and be ready to accept into your life those unexpected visitors, the unexpected signs from the Holy Spirit. And as we go through worship today, some of our songs will relate back to this as well. So keep your hearts and your minds open for what the Spirit might be bringing to you. Thank you. Our hymn of the day is Build a Longer Table in the All Creation Sings, uh, number 1062. Please stand as you are able. Build a safe. 
confess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This is the time for sharing our rivers, rivers of milestone, life milestones. So if anybody has something to share with us, oh, that's going on. Please step forward. And we'll continue with our prayers of intercession. United in the hope and joy of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Ever-present God, you make yourself known in the breaking of the bread and in the bonds of community. Re reveal yourself to us in the faces of all we meet. Strengthened by your body and blood, let us boldly live out your good news. Hear us, O oh God. As we know you in the breaking of the bread, we know you in the grains of the field and the flowing waters. Care for the earth you lovingly create. Strengthen those who safeguard threatened land and water. Hear us, O oh God. You are the authority to whom we dedicate our lives. Help us keep the needs of those most vulnerable at the forefront of our community. Move us to care for any who are disregarded or oppressed. Hear us, O oh God. Mothering God, you feed and comfort those who hunger. Open the hearts of those who hoard resources and lead them to share your abundance. We pray for anyone hungering for your comforting presence this day, especially Lori, Archie, Josh, Anne, Paul, Teresa, Bruce, Steve, Shorty, Chuck. Hear us, O oh God. You pour out your love on those who are oppressed. Support and comfort anyone who is marginalized by gender or sexuality and those whose stories are not believed. Form this community to listen faithfully and speak honestly in our ministry together. Hear us, O oh God. We remember with thanksgiving all your beloved saints. As you have raised them to eternal life, abide with us in your promise of resurrection. We especially remember um, Richard Junis, Deb Plock's dad, and um, Bonnie Keating. Hear us, O God. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise to you, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please share a sign of God's peace with one another in person and in the comments online. Our offertory hymn is in the ELW number 184, Let the Vineyards Be Fruitful, Lord. Let the vineyards be fruitful, Lord. And 
and fill to the brim our cup of blessing. Gather a harvest from the seeds that were sown, so that we may be fed with the bread of life. Gather the hopes and dreams of all, unite them with the prayers we offer. Grace our table with your bread. And give us a foretaste of the feast to come. Generous God, in this meal you offer your very self. We give thanks for these gifts of the earth. In the breaking of this bread, reveal to us the risen one. In the pouring of this wine, pour us out in service to the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The God of all who raised Jesus from the dead bless you by the power of the Holy Spirit to live in the new creation. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 650, In Christ There Is No East or West. in Christ. 